my son says to me one day, he was about 10 years old, David is his name, Dad, how come you're not like mom? And I'm like, son, mom is amazing. She is, but, but what do you mean by that? You know, mom, you know, she's got like all these tools. She works with her hands. She knows how to do carpentry. She knows how to do plumbing. I mean, everything around the house she fixes. And what do you do? You just like, you're always talking about some sort of fat sales and Trojan horses and some sort of brain surgery. What, what is this all about? Fast forward like six months later, I get some, a letter, Dr. Q, you've been awarded some sort of major award. You got to come to Washington, D.C. We're going to send a limo with you and your family can come with you. No one wanted to go. I finally convinced David, David, they can have a limo. He's going to pick us up. He says, all right, Dad, but it's a school day. Don't worry. I'm going to ask for permission. He was thrilled. He was impressed. We're in this limo. We get to this place, and here he is sitting on a table with some very famous, important people in Washington, D.C. I get an award. I come up, and I show a small video, like what I'm going to show soon, about me doing brain surgery. And his eyes just dilated. His pupils dilated. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, my son knows that I am the man. <laughs> I finish, get my award come back, sit down with him, says, David, what do you think? He goes, Dad, I had no idea that you knew how to use a drill, because he saw me using a drill, a craniotome for doing brain surgery. I hope over the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we do, not just myself, but a team of people working in our laboratory. I'll tell you a little bit about Trojan horses, fat cells, cancer, and some of the things that our team has actually learned about how to fight cancer. Let me tell you why cancer. It turns out, and most, many of you guys probably know already, cancer will be the leading cause of death in the world by the year 2025. Maybe you're not aware that as of 2012, 8 million people died a year of cancer, all types of cancer. By the year 2030, 13 million deaths in the world due to cancer. In the United States alone, when you look at the curve of heart disease and cancer, over the last five decades, cancer has been catching up very steadily and very fast. In 22 states in the United States, cancer is the number one cause of death just think about this, how ill-prepared we are to deal with cancer. It's painful. It's a disease that has affected most of us, I'm sure, in this audience, or family members or loved ones. It's extraordinarily expensive, and we're not ready to deal with this. I have dedicated my life to study cancer. And when it comes down to cancers, there's one cancer that I call it the king of cancers. And I try to explain my son this, but he, will, he wouldn't have it. He saw this picture one day of this human brain rotating. That was actually one of my patients. She was four years old. It's a beautiful brain. And then I showed David, Olivia, and Gabby this picture of cells migrating. For the first time in our laboratory, we can actually see human cancer cells migrating in the human brain and wonder why is it that we can't cure this disease. And you can see it right there in green. They're fluorescent with green fluorescent protein. They're invading the brain. They're going along the blood vessels. They are extraordinarily smart. This is indeed the most devastating cancer that affects our human body. And it happens to affect what I consider to be the most beautiful organ, which is our brain. We know that these tumors can grow. This is actually one of the papers that we publish in our laboratory. They can affect not only your function, they can completely destroy your life. And many times, we, not only as physicians, but as patients, question, what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of living with this type of cancer? I share with you one of the many experiences that I have had personally dealing and battling cancer with my own patients. This is JP, John Petrovic. I can tell you his name because he was actually featured in the news in Baltimore when I was at Johns Hopkins before I moved to the Mayo Clinic a few months ago. He was in his mid-20s, full of life. 
about to finish law school, and he wanted to change the world. As he was training for a marathon, he's found on the side of the road, seizing. He's brought into a hospital. He requested to be transferred. Right around that time, there was a show that was, had been released where they had featured me doing brain surgery. He says, I want to go with that crazy guy that has an accent at Hopkins. He didn't know how to pronounce my name. It's not that difficult. It's Quinones Hinojosa. That's why they call me Dr. Q. <laughs> but he says, I want to go with that guy. We did the surgery. It was unbelievable. We kept him awake. We actually ended up doing this surgery. And when he woke up, he was paralyzed in half of his body. Luckily, it was only temporary. He went on to train, finished his training, ended up running a full marathon. And this is the type of surgery that we did. Let me see if I can play this for you and bring you into the operating room to what I do. That's me doing brain surgery in a 19-year-old patient. That little part of the brain, uh, as I touch it, I was able to stop the patient from reading. The task performed by the patient is noticed when an essential area is stimulated. The function normalizes when the stimulation is stopped. Good. The lawyer asked the man questions. The lawyer asked questions. That's just me touching the gently are the area. And mark with the and notice how beautiful the brain is. And I am about to go and invade what I think appears to be one of the most beautiful things that I get to see very often. Here I am, making a decision as to what I'm going to take and what I'm going to leave behind in this 19-year-old patient who is incidentally a very well-known poet in Texas. Here we are, resecting the tumor, keeping the patient awake. And this was exactly the surgery that I actually did in John Petrovic. The difference was that it was right in the motor cortex. Time went on. John actually did one marathon, and how little did I know and how lost I was. He invited me to run with him, and I declined the first time. The second time, he had a second surgery within a year. The second time, he was more debilitated secondary to his surgery. And as he was waking up from anesthesia, I told him, joking, I thought he was under anesthesia. <laughs> I said, cheer up, bud. I'm going to run the half marathon with you. We were about a month and a half away from the half marathon. And a week and a half when he sees me post up, he goes, are you ready, Dr. Q? And I was like, I didn't think he was going to remember. So here I am. <laughs> you know, I start training for like a couple of weeks, and I finish that half marathon in two hours and 12 minutes. He finished in about an hour and 52. Thank you. Thank you. It was an accomplishment for me, but I was so proud of him. He flew through this, but we're not done with his story yet. He was so passionate about what we were doing in the laboratory. He passionately believed that we needed to think of new paradigms to treat cancer. He went on to raise funds. He believed that the fat cells that we were isolating from our own patients, from the belly from our own patients, and establishing stem cells we're going to help us to find a cure against cancer. This is actually a Trojan horse that sits in my office in the laboratory, actually, at the Mayo Clinic, in which you can actually see a tremendous amount of detail. He asked me to think outside the box to help him find a cure for this disease and to give many others hope because they have so little. We went on to publish some major landmarks. This is a paper, actually, where you see those red cells surrounding a brain tumor. And all we did is we trained these cells. We genetically engineered these cells, these fat cells from patients, to be able to attack tumors. And this actually made the cover of one journal. This is another cover in which all we did, we gave soluble factors, liquid basically, from our own body, from our own brain to the cells so they can actually smell it, they can sense it. And then we put it back on animal models that we use as avatars. They had the human cancer, and they were able to cure cancer in rodents. And this is actually how we train the cells. We put them in these nano groups, biomedical engineering. We have a tremendous amount of collaborative efforts with some really smart people, I tell you. We put them right there, they race, we train them. And I always tell people, this is almost like the movie Apo uh, Creed, the last one, remember when the guy is running, he's got that mark, that, that mask, 
that allows you to deprive from oxygen. That's exactly what we're doing right here. And we put them in this tract right here. And then we give them the soluble factors, and we can actually put them in these amazingly fast highways. And these are the red cells. And underneath are cancer cells, human cancer cells. So we train these cells to be able to be super f fast, super powerful cells that can actually go back and fight cancer. And that is the work that we've been doing in our laboratory. Most recently, we went on to not only engineer these cells with viruses, but we actually engineer them with nanoparticles. So now suddenly these cells are becoming the Trojan horses that we envisioned years ago when John was so diligently working to help us find a cure for cancer. This is one of the most recent papers that we published. You can actually see the tumor and that little mouse decreasing in size. This is a human tumor and an animal model that we use as an avatar with the goal of using these cells in the human body in the not too distant future to be able to cure not only brain cancer, but cancer in general. JP unfortunately left this world physically, but he left an amazing story, an amazing passion for life. He has inspired so many of us. And for me, he symbolizes so many of my patients that daily inspire me, not only with the passion they have their life, but the way they fight diseases for which we have no cure. This is actually how he wrote his own eulogy. I don't know who's here, obviously, but I hope that whoever is here and whoever wanted to be as, uh, here is what I imagine I left behind. And that is an army of people who knew that I loved them as much as I could, who will always remember me as I hoped they would, and not whatever I became as my mind wilted away or as my strength disappeared. That is how this disease begins to take our patients. And to me, there's nothing more challenging, more difficult. It's not the surgery that I do. It's not the science that I do. It's having to see my patients surrendering slowly but steadily many times to this disease and try to keep hope. And many times life will put you down on your knees. And the greatest challenge that we have and what I saw from John is getting up and trying again over and over without giving up. I asked Gabby, she's my oldest, she's 18 now. I said, Gabby, I need a butterfly. I said, Dad, why? I tell you the story about the butterfly. After JP passed away, there was one more half marathon that I wanted to do. And my objective was just to go to the distance. I wanted to finish. And I said, something has to be in yellow. Yellow was his favorite color. And that's why you see the yellow right in the middle. He loved monarch butterflies. And I said, one day, after I did the third, marathon, the third half marathon, and he wasn't there with me anymore, all I wanted to f f feel is that he was right next to me, and I finished that one in an hour and 32 minutes. He was amazing. That's the fastest I ever been. I felt that he was right there with me, I tell you. He really inspired me. He gave me strength. And I just, I couldn't get tired. The next day in the morning, this was on a Saturday, this was the Baltimore half marathon. The next day on a Sunday, I got up and I just, I had something. I just had this itch and I went for a run and I am going right through the woods, you know, up in, in, in Maryland, through behind the house and suddenly I see this butterfly that is in front of me and suddenly the butterfly takes off. And as he takes off, I see this beautiful tree and this memory hunts me right away. And I remember just about three years prior, an amazing blizzard around 2010, 2011. And we had planted in the summer a small little tree. And this, this actual tree was just getting absolutely destroyed by the blizzard. So I remember, it was on a weekend, and I got up, and I, this memory is in my brain as I'm running. And I go out there with my gloves, really cold, a stick, some rope, and a hammer, and I put a stick and I put that tree straight right in the middle of the snow, and I forgot about it. And here I am, suddenly the butterfly shows me this tree, and I remember I was that tree about three years ago, when I was completely lost, when I couldn't understand, when I thought I was going to find a cure for brain cancer by myself, with my laboratory, and how little did I know that the people that I was trying to help were going to be the people who inspire us the most. And this butterfly, incidentally, is the type of cancer that killed John. 
is called the butterfly glioma. It's so powerful that both sides of the brain get invaded by this cancer. And that's why that butterfly is so symbolic, and Gabby drew it for me a couple of days ago. And I also ask you, he says in his eulogy, that when you shed tears, when you get angry or feel agony, when you want to look at the sky with anger and want to shout, that instead you use that energy to make a difference in a way that aligns with the goals I have had all along. That goal was to have people I met think they were a little better for having known me. And I can tell you, John not only made me a better surgeon, a better physician, but he made me a better person. Over the last few years, we created a foundation that has allowed us to go all over the world to provide some of the most complex brain surgical care for patients that have very little. We also started two companies last year to, be, to serve as a vehicle that others can actually use to find cures for brain cancer. So John, this one is for you. Thank you.